Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. Well, thanks to Dr. Spock for doing another talk for us. I think most of you know David. Uh, David's professor of medicine here and director of NWAETC and he's going to talk to us today about the um, new CDC recommended HIV diagnostic testing algorithm. Great. Thanks, Brian. Well, I think we're at a point with the CDC recommendations regarding a new diagnostic testing algorithm that we're really talking about this moving now into the mainstream of laboratory care and clinical care. So I think this is a good time to talk about it. This was introduced several years ago. It was introduced as a concept. It's sort of been tested and the waters have been tested and I think many laboratories now truly are moving to this new diagnostic al uh, testing algorithm. And what I want to do in this brief time period is try and lead you through the traditional testing approach and then go through the new approach and try and point out why this is a potentially advantageous new algorithm and how that might impact your clinical practice and your potential ability to educate people about this in your community. So first of all, in terms of the traditional CDC testing algorithm, I think everybody is very familiar with this because it's been around for more than 20 years. And the basic approach, which was outlined, was that you did an initial EIA test, basically an enzyme immunoassay, and if that was repeatedly reactive, then you went on and confirmed with a supplemental test called a Western blot. You could also do it's called an IFA, but typically we're all familiar with the Western blot concept. There's some problems with that, with the conventional diagnostic algorithm. And number one, the traditional EIA and Western blots are not great tests to detect people who are acutely infected with HIV. Secondly, they do not differentiate HIV-1 and HIV-2. And third, there are definitely some problems that clinicians have encountered over the years with indeterminate Western blots that have led to a lot of additional testing and long-term follow-up with confusing situations. Now, the other thing just to briefly mention is that we also have the traditional point of care rapid testing, which traditionally has been some type of an EIA test. And if that was uh, preliminary positive on that, you went on and did a supplemental test. So just to, just to confirm, when you do a rapid test, you know, for example, the or quick oral swab, if that is reactive, that is not a diagnostic HIV test. That is a preliminary positive. Now the drawbacks of those are, again, these are not accurate tests for detecting acute HIV. And as we know, for people who've used a lot of these OrQuick tests, there have been some problems with false positives. I am going to briefly discuss, we now have a new point of care test that is a fourth generation antigen antibody test that I think may really be a game changer in terms of what you can do from the point of care rapid HIV testing. Now, just to underscore this issue of what the problem is with traditional testing is, is that in general, when you do an EIA, an enzyme immunoassay test, it typically takes about 20 to 30 days, on average about 25 days, before the antibody test is positive. And this period from the time of infection till you actually have detectable antibodies is referred to as the window period. With the Western blot, the time period is even longer, and it can take out to 35 or even 40 days before the Western blot starts turning positive. And to make matters even more confusing, initially when the Western blot turns positive, they're only partially positive because certain bands start coming in. So you can have an indeterminate Western blot following the window period. And then it's really out more around 37 to 40 days that you typically get a robustly positive Western blot with multiple bands, P2441 or GP12160. So again, the problem with these, all these traditional tests are there is a delay until the time of infection is, or until the time of the antibodies turn positive. And this is clinically a big issue because we know in the very early phases of HIV, people are highly infectious and it would be very helpful to know that they were infected at that time instead of falsely reassuring them with a negative test. Looking to a more sensitive test early on, a viral load is very good. If you look at this graph, it shows what's known as the eclipse phase, which is the time between infection 
and detectable HIV RNA levels. And this is only about 10 days. So this is significantly shorter than the time period for EIAs to turn positive. Now, the downside of this is it's not practical to use a viral load or a, um, uh, an HIV RNA assay on a routine basis as a screening test. It was an, if it was an easy test and an inexpensive test, that would be great. We would do this on every single person that we were evaluating for HIV. So it's just not a practical test. So this is just showing the juxtaposition of the HIV RNA and the HIV antibody curves and just giving you a visual sense that you really detect HIV RNA significantly before HIV antibody in someone who was just recently infected. With that in mind, let me lead into what the proposed CDC HIV testing algorithm is and what are two of the newer tests that are involved in that algorithm that you may not be as familiar with. So here's a snapshot of this testing algorithm. I won't go through the entire thing right now, but what I do want to focus in on are the newer testing methods and the areas that are highlighted or that are shadowed in brown are the areas that are the diagnostic tests. So the fourth generation immunoassay, the differentiation immunoassay, and the HIV RNA. So these are the tests now to consider. Now you're very familiar with HIV RNA, and that's only sometimes used in this, in this diagnostic testing algorithm. So I'm mainly going to focus on these top two, the fourth generation HIV-1-2 immunoassay and the HIV-1-2 differentiation assay. The fourth generation assay is a test that we have known about for several years. It is a very exciting test because it's a combination of a P24 antigen and antibody. So it's, it basically simultaneously can detect early infection and chronic infection because it's detecting the antibody and the antigen. Now, what is P24 antigen? P24 antigen is just a critical piece of the virus capsid. And, and basically, these are the two components that are in there. They're standard HIV antibodies that are formed by the human, and the HIV antigens are actually direct viral antigens that, that are basically parts of the viral capsid. And just to give you a, a, a little bit more of a visual image, this is just a, 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 screen, you know, a screenshot showing you what a viral particle looks like, and the capsid is basically like the apple core of the virus. It's the outer part of that central core of the virus. And the capsid is made up of P24 antigen. So when we're talking about P24 antigen, we're just talking about a critical structural protein for the virus that is abundant in every single HIV particle. So it's not something that you occasionally see in some strains of HIV. It is a central part of the viral structure. Now, what's new in terms of these fourth generation HIV antigen antibody combination assays? The first one was FDA approved in the US in 2011. This is known as the Architect antigen antibody combination assay. Soon thereafter, the GS HIV combo antigen assay was approved. The first one was is manufactured by Abbott, the second by Biorad. And then more recently, we have the Allure Determine rapid or point of care HIV antigen antibody combination test. So very interestingly, in October then, we, we have the approval of a point of care finger stick test that can detect both P24 antigen and HIV antibody. So this is a major advance, not only for domestically, but also in areas of the world where you may not have formal laboratories where you can do point of care testing with these uh, allele determined strips. What do we know about these fourth generation tests? These tests detect both antigen and antibodies to HIV-1 and HIV-2. They do not, however, distinguish HIV-1 and HIV-2. So that's a really critical concept. They're not gonna miss HIV-1 or 2, but they're not gonna tell you, is it 1 or is it 2? In addition, only the, the um, determined test actually distinguishes whether or not you've got antigen or antibody that's tripping the test. So this is a really good test from a sensitivity standpoint because theoretically you're picking up a lot of people early because it reduces the window by about 10 to 15 days. And in overall, this allows us to detect about 60 to 80% of people 
who are acutely infected with HIV. What it does not do, however, is accurately distinguish whether or not the person has HIV-1 or HIV-2. And as you all know, in our country, predominantly in the U.S., you know, 99% plus of the time, we're going to be having people infected with HIV-1. However, there are increasing numbers of cases of HIV-2 that have been reported. Now, how does this antigen stack up in that visual image I showed you a little bit ago with the juxtaposition of the antibody and the viral load? You can see this is pretty much smack dab in the middle. It is not as early as the viral load, but it's certainly earlier in terms of detection than the HIV antibody. So it's a significant advantage in terms of detecting people with early, and it's clearly a much more practical test than the HIV RNA test. Now, this is a little bit more specific in terms of the time frame. And this is showing you after HIV acquisition with the typical type of test we have out there when they typically trip a positive test. So typically the viral load starts to trip at about day 10 or 11, the antigen test around day 16, 17, a standard third generation EI assay somewhere in the you know day 23, day 24 in that range, the rapid tests that have been out there heretofore before the fourth generation test really didn't trip up till about day 30. And in Western blot, typically it's after uh, a month and, and often 36, 37 days before they start becoming clearly positive. So th these antigen assays are a significant in uh, advantage in terms of the time frame with our detection of people with early HIV. So because these fourth generation tests are not able to accurately differentiate one and two, this algorithm requires a second test to differentiate. And this is the so-called multi-spot test. And you may not have seen this before, but basically it's a test that you apply the specimen to. And there are four wells in this. There's the procedure control in the upper left. And then they have two different wells for HIV. Uh, one's a recombinant well, another is just a peptide well, and then they have a well for HIV-2. And in essence, you know, you just focus in on these four spots, and these are the four areas. And, and what you get in the, the, the overall result is basically a pattern of these spots that turn positive. And for example, the upper left block that you're looking at there is non-reactive. The control is positive, which is the far upper left. All the rest of them are negative, so that's considered a non-reactive. If you go down one, you can see with an HIV-1 reactive, you can get a couple different patterns. You always need the control to be positive, but then you can get uh, either that recombinant or the peptide or both of those to show up positive. And then the HIV-2 reactive is the third down, the third column down. And then the last one is where everything looks like it's positive and you can't tell if it's HIV-1 or 2. That does not happen very often. But there are people that are infected with both HIV-1 and HIV-2. So that's theoretically a possible result you could get as well. Now just to finish up, let me focus in or drill down on what exactly this testing algorithm really is and, and how we walk through it. Basically, you start off with the fourth generation HIV-1-2 immunoassay. Again, it's going to detect early infection fairly good, but it is not going to differentiate one or two infection. And if that test is negative, you essentially are done in terms of that immediate testing for that person, unless they perhaps had a very, very recent exposure to HIV. If on your left-hand side, on the red uh, plus, it's positive, then you need to move on and sort out, is it HIV-1 or is it HIV-2? And then with that differentiation assay, if you get the far left, HIV-1 positive, but HIV-2 negative, then you have a positive confirmatory test. You've got two tests that are now showing clear HIV infection, and that is considered diagnostic for HIV. You would then refer them on to medical care for, you know, viral load testing, clinical care, resistance testing, and so on. The next one over, you could get a scenario where the HIV-1 is negative and HIV-2 is positive. Again, not as frequently you're going to see that in this country. And, and as I mentioned, you could get a uh, positive 1 and 2 assay. Again, in the U.S., that would be very uncommon. Now, there is a scenario where you can get a positive screening test 
with the gen fourth generation and then have a negative differentiation assay. And the question is, how could that happen? Well, if you're thinking through this, the logical explanation would be maybe they're very early in the infection. And the differentiation assay isn't great in the first couple of weeks. So in that case, if you're positive up top and then you're negative with the second test, then you do a viral load. Because the idea is, aha, are they in the acute phase of HIV? And if your viral load is positive at that point, then you go diagnostic for acute HIV infection. Positive antigen, negative differentiation assay, positive viral load, that would indicate acute HIV infection. If that is negative, then you're a little bit stuck because now you've got one test that's screened positive and you've got two subsequent tests are negative. And the way we would interpret that is that it's very highly likely in that situation that they do not have HIV infection, but those make us a little bit nervous and we would follow up on people who have that scenario. So let me just stop there and see, what I've tried to do is basically just outline sort of where we've come from, from the simple EIA uh, followed by Western blot supplemental testing, which was not very good with acute or an early infection to this little bit more complicated algorithm. But when you break it down, it's actually not that difficult because really what we're trying to do is catch everybody with the P24 antigen antibody and then differentiate them out in terms of whether or not they have HIV one or two.